From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo and this is From the South. Today marks the one-year anniversary of the murder of Rio de Janeiro Councilwoman Mariel Franco. Citizens in Rio pay tribute to Mariel on the same street where she and her driver, Anderson Gomez, were gunned down. She is remembered for being a fearless defender of human rights as well as of the rights of Afro-Brazilians Afro and the LGBT community. The anniversary comes two days after Brazilian police arrested two former military police officers in connection with her murder. Four hundred women from the landless workers movement in Brazil occupied train tracks used by mining company Vale. But police violently broke up the protests using tear gas and rubber bullets in order to make sure the Vale trains would not be delayed. At least 10 demonstrators were injured, most of them older women. In January, a dam owned by the Vale mining company burst, killing at least 200 people. Our correspondent Ignacio Lemus was at the protest in Sarcedo. We are here at the train tracks that the bail company uses to move its goods to other countries. Women belongings to the MST are condemning bail and its practices. Almost 400 women have joined together to say bail continues to commit environmental crimes with impunity. In January, in the municipality of Rumandino, a dam belonging to bail broke, killing 200 people. Right now, we are nearby Brumadinho, and it's another dangerous area with dams. These protests are also taking place on March 14 in remembrance of the one-year anniversary of the murder of Councilwoman Mariel Franco, and come as part of a number of demonstrations that MST women have held starting on International Women's Day. Over 800 women from the Landless Workers' Movement in Brazil occupied one of the farms owned by the medium, Joao de Duas, who has been accused of sexual abuse and violence against around 500 women and jailed since December 2018. We are in one of the many areas of land owned by Joao de Deus. He is accused of exerting violence against many women during his sessions, so we have come here to denounce his abuse and we want his lands to be given over to the agrarian reform. We also want victims to be recognized and compensated. This year, we are also mobilizing on a national level against the reform promoted by the president. All Capistan women and all working women are standing up against this reform. That clearly goes against us. It's also a special date because of the anniversary of the murder of our comrade, Mariere Franco. From the farm, Don Ignacio, in Annapolis, in the state of Goiás, they remember the human rights activist, Mario Franco, and urged the clarification of the murder last March 14, 2018, and who promoted that political crime. They also criticize the machista view and the backtracking by the current government, the increase in femicides and attacks against agrarian reform. We are going through a really tricky political moment. We have two governments, one that does not accept this kind of protest, and we have a president that also rejects the landless workers' movement. This is a great challenge for us, entering this farm as a conquest. We don't know where all this money comes from, all this abuse against women, and all of the oppression that women continue to suffer. Our occupation, our protest, is a sign that we are fighting for our rights. We demand that the women are respected. Another struggle is agrarian reform. We know how important her own land is for a woman and her family. In Brazil, the country with the fifth highest number of women being violently killed, they are protesting against misery and inequality. They are calling for the end of the patriarchy. Stay in Brazil services have been held for six of the victims of Wednesday's school shooting in Susano. Family and friends gathered in a municipal sports center to pay their respects to those who were killed. It is difficult because when I was younger, I worked in that school. I studied at that school. I worked in the kitchen of that school. We never imagined that something like this could have happened and right there next to our home, where we live, where we practically know everyone, 
and share with all of these kids. We have never seen anything like this happen here. Sadly, the situation in our country is difficult. In all, 10 people were killed in the shooting, mostly school children. Police say it was carried out by two former students of the school who then killed themselves. Investigators believe it was inspired by the 1999 Columbine massacre in the U.S. And a vigil was held Wednesday night at the school. People came together to remember the victims with a religious service. It's with much pain, with much sadness. I think that no one expects this from a young person. Young people should be spending their energy studying, playing sports, not these things. Much sadness, much pain. I think that this act didn't only hurt the victims, but it hurt society. It hurt our city. It hurt Brazil. Everyone is feeling this. Authorities in Nigeria have called off the search for survivors after a building collapsed in Lagos Island. The building housed a primary school and a nursery. It came down on Wednesday morning, killing at least 10 people. At least 37 people were rescued alive. It's believed more than 100 students were in the three-story building when it came down. The governor of Lagos says the school was operating illegally. He blamed the landlord for resisting the government's demolition plan. This very school, they've already asked them to renovate, to vacate from that building. So they're remarkable. It's a government that's taking bread from the lungs. So that's why they retain the, the building there. So all that happened is fed from the allowance from the government. You understand? Because we that are living here, we don't have the power to go there and demolish it. It's our government. Venezuela has condemned the decision by Ecuador to pull out of the South American regional bloc, UNASUR. On Wednesday night, the Ecuadorian president, Lenin Moreno, went on TV to claim that the body had ceased to have a function and blamed what he called the vices of the 20th century socialism. He also said his government would remove the statue of the former Argentinian president, Nestor Kirchner, located in the building in Quito, who was the first secretary general of UNASUR. We will no longer participate in any of the organization's activities. We will not allocate one more cent, nor additional contribution to the organization's budget. We have begun the internal proceedings to officially leave the UNASUR Treaty. In response, Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza tweeted a quote from Latin American's independence leader Simón Bolívar. It said, we cannot have traitors in our ranks, otherwise we would lose our great homeland. Simón Bolívar led the first unification of Latin American nations in the 19th century. The government of Venezuela has announced electricity has been fully restored across the country this Thursday. The Caracas metro is fully functional again as people have returned to work. Communications Minister Jorge Rodriguez said the government has overcome cyber and sabotage attacks on its power system, which began last Thursday. He added that drinkable water has also been restored to 80% of the country. Let's take a look at the streets of Caracas after the massive power outage. Quiet streets. Calls for peace continue to resonate. Here in the neighborhoods, we want peace for our communities. We don't want war in better wars. We want peace and we want wholeheartedly support our president, Nicolás Maduro. With dark days behind them, the people look ahead. Their resilience shines through as they overcome adversity with a smile. Regardless of our political position, it's important to think about who was attacking us, President Nicolás Maduro or the opposition and the lackeys of the empire. It's important to remember who is bringing electricity and water back, President Nicolás Maduro. It's evident that there's a social struggle in various corners of Caracas. The defense of the Bolivarian Revolution is strengthened by every community's achievement. Here they took electricity, water and food away from us. We are going to continue with a peaceful and participatory revolution. Always loyal, never traitors. As infrastructure and social programs continue to be attacked, contingency plans are being put in place with the participation of citizens who are on the front lines of the resistance. 
On Wednesday, a judge in Argentina revealed details of an extraordinary web of extortion and espionage surrounding the so-called notebooks case. That's the investigation into alleged corruption by the former president Cristina Fernandez and her family. They have repeatedly said the accusations have been invented by her political opponents. Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Sarabina Roth, has more. After the federal judge Ramos Padilla appeared on Wednesday before the Freedom Expression Committee of Congress, of the leaders of the governing coalition, Elisa Carrio tweeted a picture of herself in stripped pajamas, and she said that the opposition and the judge want to see her in jail. This tweet provoked angry reactions in social media because this is a case with very serious implications, unlike anything seen since the return of democracy. At the committee hearing, the judge showed overwhelming evidence of a network of illegal operations linked to judges, ministers, and other politicians, as well as the security forces and the media. The official party of Macri didn't attend the hearing. They accused Kishner supporters of an operation to remove the attorney general, Carlos Estranelli, from the notebook case. But it is not true that this would end the case because there are two attorneys on the notebook case, so it would continue without him. The argument for removing Estranelli is that a lot of evidence has emerged linking him to another lawyer in the case, Marcelo D'Alessio, who is under arrest for allegedly blackmailing a number of witnesses. D'Alessio is also accused of working for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration. The U.S. Senate has passed a proposal to end the national emergency declared by President Donald Trump. Twelve Republican senators broke rank and sided with Democrats to try to put an end to Trump's so-called national emergency. In response, President Trump took to social media to simply tweet the word veto, followed by an exclamation mark. Trump declared a national emergency last month in order to bypass Congress and fund his long-promised border wall. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Human rights organizations in Guatemala are worried about recent cases of lynching of alleged criminals. They say it shows the state is not providing security and justice to the population. The human rights organization Mutual Support has published a report on lynchings in Guatemala with alarming figures. In the last 10 years, the country has seen 1,656 incidents in which 360 people were killed and there have been more lynchings in 2019. In 2019, just in January, there were already four lynchings and eight more in February. But the report was prepared in January and it only deals with those four lynchings. Two happened in Esquintla, one in Quetzaltenango, and another in Weiweitenango. The report states that people chose to lynch criminals because they're fed up that the police are not doing their job and arresting those who commit crimes. Other cases are linked to extortion and sexual abuse. The failure of the state to guarantee justice has led to the increase in lynchings, the report states. We are really worried because this shows Guatemala as a violent country where problems are not resolved by the institutions. There is a complete lack of trust in public institutions, especially the police and the justice system. Researchers say that for many years, people believed that lynchings only happened in indigenous communities of the interior of the country. However, last year, the central region, including the capital, saw many lynchings. In this region, crime figures remain the same compared with other regions where lynchings have reduced the level of crime. We can see that in most of the country where homicides take place, there are no lynchings. But where there are lynchings, there are no homicides either. Only two districts have both kinds of violence. The Department of Guatemala has a high murder rate of 54 for every 100,000 inhabitants. And it was also reported that in 2018, there were 15 lynchings. The demand from human rights activists is for the state to assume its role in guaranteeing justice and security. Because if it doesn't, lynchings will continue, with furious citizens supposedly taking justice into their own hands, but in fact committing brutal crimes themselves. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister can breathe a sigh of relief after a medical test proved that he has no need for heart surgery. Keith Rowley posted a photo of himself and his doctor in the U.S. as he shared the news on social media. The PM left for the U.S. last week for coronary testing.
He'll remain under observation for a few more days before returning home. In 2016, while undergoing prostate cancer screening, Rowley also underwent coronary testing that revealed soft plaque in his arteries. Indicating that today I would also in Trinidad and Tobago, biodegradable and eco-friendly packaging for the food and beverage industry will be exempt from custom duties for the next two years. The move coincides with the decision to ban the importation and use of styrofoam packaging this year. The government says the ban would be implemented once the required custom codes are finalized. Jamaica's government is placing greater focus on gender issues and has allocated close to $70 million to purchase property for women's shelters. You would have heard um, of resources allocated for two additional centers to assist women who find themselves in situations of conflict or situation um, in which they are being abused. We had allocated resources to build one last year, and now we've allocated resources for an additional two. Grenada's government has launched an investigation into a company that benefited from the island's citizenship by investment program. The company called Grenada Sustainable Agriculture failed to deliver on a state-of-the-art shrimp farm. Prime Minister Keith Mitchell says the government is seeking regional and international support to deal with the pro raiders as they collected significant sums of money. On October 6th. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration decided to ground all Boeing 737 MAX 8 jets until further notice and it has caused distress at some Caribbean airports. At least one American Airlines model at Trinidad's Biarco International Airport is unable to leave the country. And in Barbados, dozens of American Airlines passengers were also left in shambles after MAX 8 flights were canceled. The European Union has added five more Caribbean countries to its tax haven blacklist, and CARICOM isn't happy about it. Barbados, Bermuda, Aruba, Belize, and Dominica failed to make specific commitments to adapt their tax rules and practices according to EU standards. However, CARICOM Secretary General Erwin LaRocque says many of the countries are compliant according to re uh, relevant regulatory authorities. CARICOM leaders say the EU's blacklisting has brought considerable damage to the community. Of this council today touch on issues that affect the lives of the citizens. Bolivia's central bank says it will maintain its own policies, which have been, so far, a major success for the country's economy. Let's find out more. The Central Bank of Bolivia implemented the counter-cyclical policy. What it means is that the government manages the economy so that the prices of raw materials don't drop and spending is reduced. In times of global economic contraction, we have expanded credit and a policy for reducing interest rates. Adapting measures that go against the norm of economics has proven to be successful for the Bolivian economy. The exchange rate has remained stable, which without doubt favored expansionary policies by generating lower inflation. All of this is contrary to what has been happening to other economies. Because of its counter-cyclical policy, Bolivia is expected to lead in economic performance in the region this year, like it has done for the last five years. We will continue fighting against the adverse effects of economy cycles to avoid undermining our economy. We want to avoid employment and depriving families. A stable exchange rate will persist. We at the central bank are confident about this. In 2019, experts estimate that the country's GDP will grow by over 4.5% because of a nearly $8 billion state investment. We'll take a short break now, don't go away.
Welcome back. More than 100 people have died as flash floods ravaged Mozambique and Malawi. Thousands of people have been displaced. Villages are underwater, power has been knocked out, and so has the water supplies in some places. Mozambique officials have declared a red alert due to the continuing rains and the approach of the tropical cyclone Idai. Malawi's president declared a state of disaster last week. Kenyan women have expressed outrage over the Always brand sanitary pads, saying they cause rashes, burns, and discomfort. Using the Twitter hashtag MyAlwaysExperience, they have condemned the brand, suggesting that a cheaper version of the product is sold in Africa. Several groups in Zambia and South Africa have also begun protesting this. A newly appointed Algerian Prime Minister has said his government will aim at responding to the demands of the youth. Bedoui was speaking ahead of Friday's planned mass demonstrations against the cancelled presidential election. So far, It will be a formation that will represent all the energies and especially the youth through Algerian women and men to hopefully be up to expectations of these ambitions. We have seen students, we have seen teachers, we have seen doctors, we have seen all parts of the Algerian society, and I assure you once again, we are ready, determined, and our desire is strong and our doors are opened to discuss and exchange visions. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, NUMSA, will pick it outside the U.S. consulate in Johannesburg in protest against interference in Venezuela. In a media statement, the union said the picket is part of global actions to defend the sovereignty of Venezuela and the Bolivarian Revolution. NUMSA members will be joined by members of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party. They have called on other progressive organizations to take part in defending Venezuela's sovereignty. The World Health Organization has announced it has contained the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It said the number of new cases in the epicenter has dropped by over 50 percent. The organization, however, said the deteriorating security situation in the region poses a threat to the progress made in containing the epidemic. The current Ebola outbreak first declared last August is believed to have killed more than 550 people so far and affected over 300 more. In January there were 50 cases per week. Now we have an average of 25 cases per week, so there is a decline of the number of cases per week. Despite the incredibly difficult situation, the outbreak has been contained in 11 out of the 28 communities that have had cases. And now let's take a look at some other stories from around the world. The head of the state-backed Saudi Human Rights Commission has dismissed an international investigation into the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The commission described the investigation as interference, adding that everyone accused was already facing justice in the country. Khashoggi, a Washington Post columnist, was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October, provoking an international outcry. Polish bishops have presented a report on the number of cases of child abuse in the clergy between 1990 and 2018, in which nearly 400 clergymen were found to have committed sexual abuse of minors. The report presented to Pope Francis coincided with the gathering of the world's top Catholic bishops at the Vatican summit on tackling clerical sex abuse. Protests have rocked India's southern state of Tamil Nadu after videos showing sexual assault on female college students were posted online. Outrage increased after police said this was part of a wider plot by a group of men who befriended female students for sexual acts, then filmed them and used the video footage to blackmail them. Student protesters and women's rights campaigners demand police swift investigation of the cases and provide protection to the victims. We have come here on behalf of National Women's Front to show support to the affected women who have been facing sexual harassment for the past few years in Polach. The alleged crime boss of the New York Mafia's Gambino family, Francesco Cali, has been killed in front of his estate and island home. Police sources confirmed he was shot multiple times by unidentified gunmen. Gambino crime operation is one of the five historic Italian-American mafia families in New York and believed to make money through violence and extortion and illegal drug distribution. 
British members of parliament have voted to delay Brexit, giving embattled Prime Minister Theresa May more time to break the dead deal lock. MPs voted 412 to 202 for a motion which instructs the Prime Minister to ask the European Union for an extension to the withdrawal the process. The Following the vote, May is expected to head to Brussels to ask that the European Union keep the UK in the block until June 30th. The eyes to the right. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesor English, I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.